Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull is planning to introduce legislation to force tech and social media companies to help Australian security agencies access messages from suspected criminals. But the details of exactly how this will be accomplished remains unclear. It comes as experts warn that countries like Australia need to be better prepared for cyber attacks. Well, to talk us through this and other issues, entrepreneur and residence for Blue Chile, Alan Jones is here. Alan, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, so the talk obviously the past mm. week has been about encryption, um, methods that uh, the Australian government want to use yeah. to try and crack some of those, particularly as far as uh, any use by criminals concerned. How prepared do you think Australia is to fight cybercrime? I think Australia in general is very well prepared to fight cybercrime through our relationships with other major forces in the world trying to do the same thing and also by having a strong secure democracy as well where we have transparency in what's going on, law levels of government and, and what our citizens are doing. I think the challenge that we face is that there are a lot of vulnerabilities out there in the systems that we use to communicate these days and we're living in an increasingly connected world so more and more of the things we use and the systems we use for transporting and trading are connected to the internet and every time something is connected to the internet there's a potential there that there might be a vulnerability that someone could exploit to use it for harm. Well I think some of us um, have raised concerns at that um, what the government's proposing with being able to access uh, encrypted messages uh, that that might pr prove to be yet another vulnerability. It's it's uh, it's concerning and also um, disconcerting as well um, it, it's it's really not possible to on the one hand have strong secure systems um, for the, for Australia to be able to, to count on and depend upon it, while at the same time having backdoors and vulnerabilities available for for anybody to, to access to get access to that information you can't really have both and when we see the the um, government and non-government actors um, uh, wreaking havoc in systems today they are using systems that were developed by government security agencies as backdoors into systems. Well, well, and in fact, we've got that example uh, this morning with uh, you know news from the NSA in the states, essentially you know warning Australia and some of its allies that uh, some of these cyber criminals have have managed to steal that uh, that critical mm. defence information as far as cyber security is concerned from them, mm. and then apply it mm. Um, mm. to uh, to hack some systems. So we can make an, an organisation like the NSA very very secure, but there's nothing that we can do to change the psychology of people. You know, people get disillusioned, people get bribed, mm. people move on and change careers, and, and every time you know that happens, an organisation like the NSA is no more or less porous than than a private enterprise like Apple or Facebook um, or any of us as individuals. Um, and we really can't engineer against that that risk. So the only way to protect ourselves is really to keep our uh, our encryption secure from everybody. Uh, just, just sorry, just on that point. I mean, just speaking to, to, to some friends and colleagues, they're sort of increasingly increasingly concerned about putting some of their sensitive information online, such as in a cloud. Should we be concerned about that? Would it be better to try and store that at home, offline? No, there's, there's really no security advantage in, in um, whether it's stored in the cloud or, or in your home, unless you want to run your home like a bank vault, and I don't think many of us do. Um, and, and there are tremendous advantages for us in being able to access our data from, from everywhere, when we're at home, when we're travelling on the train and so on and so forth. And I think those advantages outweigh the, the risks quite massively. And the technologies themselves that encrypt that data for us really are as secure as they can be. And even the companies that, that run those clouds for us can't access that data at the moment until we pass crazy legislation. Mm. It is a rapidly shifting landscape there. But let's talk about something that's also rapidly moving, sure. and that is the Hyperloop. Now, I, yeah. this is a fascinating development. Um, just explain to us, what is the Hyperloop? What's being sought here? And is it just hype? <laughs> yeah. um, no, th there is some hype, but there's also some science behind this as well. Um, so if you take 300 people on a passenger plane and uh, take them up to 30,000 feet, um, you're moving through a lot of very thick air on the way, and that limits the speed that you can get to and also tremendously increases the amount of fuel and energy you need to get up to that altitude. Right? If we put those people under the ground in a tunnel where most of the air has been evacuated from that tunnel, we're no longer pushing through air to take those 300 A vacuum tube. Exactly. A very, very long 
strong vacuum tube. It has particularly useful applications in places with very, very congested transport routes. And so at the moment, the focus is between San Francisco and, and Los Angeles. But here in Australia, the, the, the air route between Sydney and Melbourne is one of the busiest air routes in the world. So, you know, maybe we'll finally get a, a very fast train under the ground. Yeah, I guess we, we shouldn't be surprised that this was an idea that Elon Musk came up with, but he said, I'm too busy. I'm going to outsource this. And so what do these guys manage to do as far as the test is concerned? Well, Elon synthesised a lot of science which already existed and I guess gave everybody permission to believe that this could become a commercial re reality one day and then gave it all away, free to industry and to science to, to explore and, and to create. Um, and so what we're starting to see now is, is prototypes testing um, on tracks in evacuated tubes. Um, gradually, those tracks will get longer and longer. So at the moment, they're only running, you know, 100 metres or so, um, and the trains are accelerating to about 100 kilometres per hour. But the goal is to get that up, you know, higher than 500 kilometres per hour, um, and for those routes to run three, four, five thousand kilometres. So how quickly is that development process progressing? I don't think any of us will have a chance yeah. to, to ride on, on one of those rails. <laughs> no, um, maybe when we're that's very, really very disappointing. old. disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to do something about that. It's, it's not running on a rail, it's, no. it's maglev. That's right, that's yeah, right. So, so magnetic floating, on floating essentially on... Yeah, and so there's there's a combination of, of, of floating on air and, yep. and floating on a, on a magnetic um, uh, uh, field, and then every so many um, hundred meters, there's a there's another big um, electronic electric motor, which um, sends the thing flying off again on its almost frictionless journey. It looks very expensive. Obviously, you've got to create the corridor, you've got to build the tube. Uh, when you break it down economically against a traditional high-speed train, mm. is it going to be much more expensive, do you think? It's a tremendously big investment to get it built in the first place mm. and put in, but then once it's operating, it's actually really very efficient. It doesn't take very much power um, when you're working in a vacuum and you've got a magnetic field holding something up, um, and to push something forward in that almost vacuum environment is costs very little as well. So once they're up and running, I think they'll be tremendously useful. They'll last a very, very long time, and they'll be able to service a lot of passengers, but only on that one route at a time. And the chance of a catastrophic accident are, are limited. Well, the chances of catastrophic accidents are something for insurers to worry about. So first we need to see the <laughs> right. technology well, up and running. Well, because it's more contained in a vacuum yeah. tube, I guess, you know, compared with a Less likely to with a train, yeah. a traditional train or a, or a plane. Or yeah. A, a, some kind of There's a few accident. very big, scary geological fault mm. lines well, between let's, Los Angeles Let's not get too gloomy. <laughs> I, I was thinking of Australia. I think we should right. do it in Australia <laughs> yeah. first. <laughs> okay, well, speaking of getting things up and running, of course, um, the, the startup community is thriving. I, I read uh, some figures saying that for the June quarter we saw some $300 million being invested in Australia in startups. Um, and we've also had the recent announcement from the New South Wales government around creating a hub in the centre of Sydney. So a very optimistic um, outlook then, I think. It's very encouraging to see um, a government engagement at all levels, local, state and federal, and, and how they can support an innovation industry, industry in Australia. Because for the longest time we've been penalised in our export industries by being the world's most isolated first world economy. And when we're shipping software and when we're shipping hardware um, that we've manufactured over to those markets, software has a zero export cost. You know, and we can land that software in markets all around the world at the same price. So it's great to see government getting on board and, and helping. So at a local government and at a state government level, um, we can help by providing lower cost um, office space and places for people to come together and learn from each other. And that's what the New South Wales State Government has, has um, announced this week. It's great to see it on York Street. My office is just up from York Street, so I'll be able to walk to this. Um, but more importantly, it's right on top of Wynyard Railway Station, which means that anybody in Sydney can access that via a bus or a train. Um, Sydney and Melbourne are, are some of the most expensive um, places to work in the world. Um, and we can create more innovative startup businesses more cheaply and hence more quickly if we're helping them with that early first few years of development. Alan Jones, future's looking quite rosy, I think. It is, it is. <laughs> Above and below ground. Excellent. <laughs> Alan Jones from Blue Chili. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks.